So I've, I've mentioned to you guys a few times over the last few years or the last few months uh, about how I have really kind of been pressed on me to, to be ready to prove my faith, to be ready to, to share the gospel. Um, and that all in, a, in an effort to strive to be ready to, to, to really just prove that and, and have proof ready to say and show how the Bible points to the one true living God. That there's really only one true living God and that all other religions, all other gods out there that are talked about, that are given, are just all made up by humans. But this, this one true God that I believe in is the right one, is the one that all will hold to in the end. So in 2017, this kind of started for me. 2017, I was, I was out down in Charlottesville, and we were, we were hanging out, and, and um, it was me and my coworkers were there, and we went down to Charlottesville to kind of have a, uh, what we call an off-site, where we sat around and we strategized. We made the strategic plans, and we talked with each other, and we, we went down to Charlottesville intentionally as a small team. There were like six, eight of us that went down there, and we went down there as a small team because we, we didn't just want to be co-workers. We also wanted to trust one another. We had to be a team in that work environment, and we needed to be able to have some time really spent to talk about each of our own strengths, each of our own weaknesses in the workplace and with each other so that we knew how to use each other best. So we, we, we would go down there, we'd, we'd stay in a hotel, and we'd, we'd go to dinner each night, and we'd hang out with each other, and we just kind of made that kind of a, an encampment little period where we just kind of really hung out. And it was one of the nights that we were there, we were out at dinner, um, right on that nice, awesome walkway, the, the walking path in downtown Charlottesville where all the restaurants are at, and there's no cars, and you kind of sit outside, and we were sitting outside, and we were just kind of all at a big table together, and one of my coworkers uh, turns to me and he says, hey, Jason, why is it that the Bible or Christianity thinks that it's the only religion? Why is that the only way to get to God? Why do you guys believe that? Now, he was, he was, he, he was American Indian and he grew up in a, a very nature-based religion and, and saw that as another way. And, and so he, he posed that to me in that very casual kind of conversation that we were all kind of having. Because he knew that I was a Christian, and I don't, I don't hide that at work. I make it very clear and plain that I'm, I'm a Christian, and, and I talk about it from time to time. I don't, I don't preach it, but I talk about it. I make sure that people understand or know. And he asked, with all of my coworkers looking on, so how would you answer that question? Would you be prepared to answer a question like that if your coworkers posed that to you? Are you ready to defend your beliefs, to defend the Bible as we have it, to, to be able to quickly say, this is why. This is why I believe that. This is why the Bible points to the one and only true God. I thought I was. Oh, I, I, I had spent my whole life like in church, and I thought that I was like, yeah, I'm ready. I fumbled it, totally fumbled it, dropped that football on the ground, and the other team picked it up and ran with it. I lost my moment with my coworkers. I will never get that moment back where eight of us sitting around a table, casually having a conversation, and offer me the chance that I've been praying for for years. Hey, when's that moment, God, that you're going to give me where I get to share your gospel, where I get to share your word? Help me. Give that moment to me. And he gave it to me, and I'm like, nope, failed. Drop that ball. I'll never get that moment back because I wasn't prepared. I wasn't as prepared as I thought I would be. I wasn't prepared to share with my coworkers who aren't, most of them are not believers, why they should consider the Bible and the Christian faith. When the entire news media, with all of social media, looking upon the Christian faith in such a negative view, and that's really the only view that they see, and they came to me and they said, hey, what's that mean? 
Why is this? Why should I consider this? So I don't want that to be me anymore. And in 2017, I began to strive to get better, to strive to learn, to learn more. And we, were, we actually had the Go and Shine ministry come here to the church, and they, they gave us a, a little bit of a snippet on a Saturday. You know, we spent like, what, four or five hours here on a Saturday talking with uh, the Go and Shine folks um, about how to, how to do that outreach, how to do ministry, how to, how to spread the gospel. Um, John, you, you have some fantastic points, and I, I, I look forward to hearing more about your mission coming up and how you're going to share the gospel um, and, and how, you've, how you have an evangelistic uh, love for God. But I wasn't ready, and I, and I, I don't want that to be you. So, I wanted to take the time today to start with the basics with you. To start with the basics, the Bible itself. And why would any, anybody even consider the Bible as a relevant source? Well, frankly, there's never been a book like it ever written. It's not really a book even. It's 66 different books written by 40 different authors over the span of 1,500 years that tells a single story of God seamlessly end-to-end -end, over 60 books, over 100, 100, uh, you know, 1,500 years, 40 different authors telling this same story seamlessly across time. Never been a book like that before. But just because it has 66 books, does that make the Bible the Word of God? No. But it certainly makes it a book that she should be considered and looked at. It makes, that fact alone opens the door to a conversation with your friends, with your non-believer friends, with your, with your co-workers, with, with somebody who is asking the question because there's never been a book like that written in history. So what about the history? We have all these archaeological finds and everything, and, and people point to the history of the earth constantly about, well, what about this and what about that? And I would say that just be, I would say that for hundreds of years, archaeologists have used the Bible as a guide, as a guide to our history as a human race, as a guide using the Bible, to, using the Old and the New Testaments to find peop, our people, our civilizations, our kings, our races. Using the Bible, they go to where the Bible says that that thing should be. They dig it up, and all of a sudden, it's there, something that's never been written in any other book. And they go, hey, the Bible is historically accurate. This proves that the Bible is historically accurate, exactly where it should be. But does that make it the Word of God? No. No, it doesn't. But it does mean that the Bible is historically accurate and something to be considered. And then, early on in the Bible, in, in the first section of the Bible, it says God's going to show up here on earth and walk among us. And lots of religions and people have said that. But don't worry, God says. I'm going to prove it, as a rational God would do. And then God gave prophecies to those writers of the Bible during those those 1,500 years, and He gave them prophecies throughout time showing that He is the one true God that is not trapped in time, that He can see the future, that He, ha he knows the future. About 300 of those prophecies point to Jesus, but many others are given by God and then fulfilled exactly as that prophecy was fulfilled and then documented in later books of the Bible. They're documented, and you can cross-reference those documentation of those events through other non-religious history books. Once again, showing that the Bible is true. And then one day, it says, uh, uh, so, and then the prophecies say that, um, to add validity, to, uh, let me go back. <laughs> so those prophecies that were given and fulfilled show that what is written is truth, and they add validity to the 300 or so prophecies that are given that point to the one man in all of history, to the Son of God that's going to come and walk amongst us, reveal Himself and God to us as a human race. And then one day that man shows up, and he says to the Jewish leaders, of the time that he's the guy. He's the guy that all these prophecies are written about. 
that he's the guy that has come to forever change the game of life. And he says, and the Jewish leaders challenged him, and, and John captures that in, in John chapter 10, verses 22 through 28, or 38. And within that larger section of verses, within 24 and 25, and Jesus answers them, the Jewish leaders, and when they're questioning him and challenging him on this, and he says, I told you, and don't you believe, and you don't believe that the works that I do in my Father's name, these works, these testify to me. I and the Father are one, in verse 30 there. Impossible, right? That He is truly the one that fulfills all of these 300 prophecies. And I gave you the astronomical odds of that occurring and that happening when I stood in front of you last time, that there would be one man who fulfills all of them, yet there was. And Jesus claimed to be that person, and He went on to show that how, all three, how He fulfills all 300 of them. For the doubters who would say, yeah, yeah, He fulfilled them in the book, but that's because they wrote the book after He lived, and, and they just wrote it so that it made it look like He made up that stuff and He was able to fulfill all of those things. And I would say, no, you got your, you got your facts wrong. The earliest version or the latest version that we have of a physical copy is 250 years before Christ was born of the Old Testament. That's valid, valid, verifiable information. You can't say that we wrote that afterwards. Jesus Himself goes on to fulfill those 300 prophecies, but but we have recorded proof of that. We know that the Torah was maintained by the Jewish people. It existed before Christ. And Christ Himself, Jesus Himself, cited the Old Testament constantly, even saying that He had come to fulfill the law previously written by the others long ago. Does that make the, the Bible the Word of God? No. But it's starting to get really close. And that's something to be considered by those who don't believe yet. And then Jesus, say, Jesus says this, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove to you, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to come back three days later. Full out claim. And that's the Easter sermon, that He's going to come back fully and alive in the flesh, and the Easter sermon that He's going to die, and every year we hear, every year we hear that on Easter in almost every church across this nation. It's all about the resurrection. What happened after? That's what proves that the Bible is the Word of God. That Jesus is our Lord and Savior who came down to earth and died on the cross and rose three days later. It's all about the resurrection. Even Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians. And he says, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Our faith is in vain. If this didn't happen, this is the crux to everything. So let's examine that. Let's examine the resurrection Let's take that from the Easter sermon and move that one step forward. Let's examine from four different perspectives, four different authors who had a different view but wrote similar things. We're going to talk, let's look, look through those as we provide their view of how things went down. So I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles. I'm not going to be able to read all of them. We're going to start in Matthew, turn with me to Matthew 28. So if you have a device, Flip open the Bible app, pull up Matthew 28. If you have a Bible, physical Bible, go ahead and turn it to Matthew 28. That's the first book in the New Testament, right at the end of that book. And I'm not going to have time, unfortunately, to read every account verbatim. Some of them will summarize, but I encourage you to go back and reread them. Read each one of them in detail. Examine the evidence for yourself. Cross-reference it with other, uh, uh, other text. And Chase is going to try and keep up with me as I put them on the screen. And, and as we go along, there'll probably be a few places where I summarize them faster than you can read them on the screen, which is why I ask you to open your Bible, open your app. So starting with me in chapter 28. Now after the Sabbath, 
As it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the tomb. So this is after Christ was crucified. They put him in the tomb. This is three days later. On the third day after that, and behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled the stone and sat, and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing was white as snow, and the guards shook from fear, and it became like dead men. So in 5 and 7, Mary describes how Mary finds the tomb empty. And the angel tells Mary that Jesus is risen and to go tell the disciples that He's risen and for them to go to Galilee. That little bit of Galilee is important. We'll come back to that. And then in 9 and 10, Matthew summarizes. He kind of he captures this whole thing. And behold, Jesus met with them and told them to go to Galilee and they would see Him again. Matthew really doesn't detail and provide the details here of Jesus' appearance to the disciples, just that the fact that He did, and before they went to Galilee. So it says, Jesus arrived and showed Himself, behold, Jesus was there, and then also told them to go to Galilee. So in verse 16, the disciples followed Jesus' instructions and traveled to Galilee, but it wasn't probably just the disciples. It wasn't just the 11 of them. No, they would have told people at this point, especially the people that had been following Jesus, that had been moving across the country with them over the last three years. There were ardent like listeners and followers of Christ that weren't the disciples, but they were very solidly based. There were other believers. And once there, in verse 17, he talks about once there, they saw Jesus again and they worshiped Him. And then Matthew here documents that they were, there were some that were doubtful. Well, it wasn't the disciples, I'll tell you that. Because Matthew is referring, the point at which time in Matthew is referring to actually happens after Thomas and when Jesus proves himself to Thomas. So it's not the disciples at this point, but it's others. So it shows that there were others that were there that were doubtful. So the they and some listed here in Matthew is most likely part of the 500 that Paul talks about during his account that we'll get to in a minute. So that Matthew's is fairly short and succinct. He doesn't get into a lot of detail. And as we go through this, we're going to get into Matt, Luke and Mark who give in a lot more detail. So let's move over to Luke. So flip over with me to Luke 24. And Luke's account of the resurrection is a little more detailed than Matthew's. So similar to Matthew's account, Luke repeats that the angel appeared to Mary and the other women, that Jesus has risen, and to go and tell the disciples. But Luke adds a little bit there in 11 that they didn't believe them. So let's look at that real quickly as we go through this. In verse 1, we talks about the women and being the first day of the week, an early dawn, and the women had brought the, the spices and that they had prepared, and they found this tomb rolled, the, the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered, they didn't find the body, but while they were there, they were perplexed by this. And the, the women were very confused. And then two men suddenly stood with them. saying, why are you here? Why are you seeking the living one among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee. So reminding the women that Jesus had said, hey, this is going to happen, and that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinful men. So this is the angels continuing to talk to Mary and, and the other women, and he must be crucified, and on the third day he will rise from the dead. And they remembered the words, and they're like, oh yeah, God, he, or, or, he did say that. Jesus did say those things to us, but I didn't fully get it. And they still really don't here. And they returned to the, from the tomb, and they, they went back to the, to the eleven to report all to the rest of them, and to the, so to the eleven and all the rest of them, showing that there was once again more than just the 11 that the women were repeating this to, telling this to, telling that, that the, the tomb was, be, to, was found open. So in verse 10, it goes on to say that, Now the women were Mary Magdalene, Jonah, and Mary, and the mother of James. And the other women, 
that were with them were telling them these things. But the words appeared to them, being the disciples and those that they were telling them to, as nonsense. They didn't believe the women. So Peter got up and ran to the tomb. And when he stopped and looked in, he saw that the linen wrap, there was only the linen wrappings there. And he walked away and went home, confused and marveling at what he had saw. Matthew kind of stops there. On that section, um, and that's kind of where he leaves it. John, we'll talk a little bit about John and, and how he adds a little bit more to that. And in verse 13 through 35, Matt, Luke, sorry, so Luke documents it to there, and then Luke adds a new story here for us, and then documents an account told by Cleopas. So Cleopas is Jesus' uncle, and his son, Simon, who's Jesus' nephew, and, and as they're walking on this road to Emmaus, Jesus appears to them on the road as they're talking about the crucifixion and the fact that the stone was rolled away and the women had found it empty. So they were one of the many or the others that were there amongst the disciples when Mary came back. So we'll start here in 15. And while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So once again, the, Jesus wasn't ready to completely reveal himself because he had things that he wanted to say, and he needed them to pay attention to the things that he wanted to say, so, he, so God and Jesus stopped them from seeing who he was as he walked, and he said to them, what are these words that you're exchanging to, with one another as you're walking? And they, came, they, they all stopped, and they're like, what do you mean? And they looked sad. And, and one of them, named Cleopas, answered and said, Are you possibly the only person living in Jerusalem who does not know about the things that have happened in these past few days? And Jesus said to them, What sort of things? Not quite sure. Tell me about these things. And they said to him, those about Jesus, the Nazarene, who proved to be a prophet, mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and crucified with him. But we're going, we were going, we were hoping that he was the one who would be redeemed, who would de redeem Israel. So they still had this idea that Jesus was going to come back and redeem Israel, that he was in their Jewish idea of who that Christ should be, that returned son should be, was that he was going to, uh, he was going to, to get rid of the Romans, that he was going to um, get them out of the persecution once again of their overseers, of, their, of the Romans at this point. And now it's the third day, and since all these things happened, but some of the women among us left us bewildered. And they were about to, they were, when they went to the tomb, it said in the early morning that they did not find the body. And they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels and that he was alive. And that though, those, some of those who were with us went to the tomb, found it just exactly as the women had said, but him they did not see. And then they said to him, said to them, you foolish men. So then he said to them, so Jesus, saying this to Cleopas and his son, You foolish men, and slow of heart to believe in all that prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to come, and to come into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them all the things that were written about himself in Scripture. So, as Jesus continued to walk with them on the road, they still didn't know who He was, and He continued to just tell them examples after examples of where in the Old Testament it points clearly and plainly to Jesus, His death and His resurrection. And once Jesus had finished explaining all of these things he, that were written about Him in the Scripture... Um, I mean, he spent the entire day there with them, and finally, at the very end of the day, leaning back, grabbing a piece of bread, he opened their eyes, and they knew instantly 
that it was Jesus that they had been talking to the entire day. And as soon as they understood that, they, Cleopas and Simon immediately got up and rushed back to tell his disciples in Jerusalem what had happened. So they had spent the entire day traveling to Emmaus, got to the end of the day, finished their travels, sat down, finally had a proper meal. Oh my goodness, that's Jesus who's been walking with me the entire day, explaining all of this stuff to me. I now need to go and tell the disciples. And they didn't wait till the next morning. No, they immediately got up and they rushed back to Jerusalem, a full day's travel. So, as, right, so as that was happening, so that if, if we're going to move down to verse 36. So this is after they've rushed back. Cleopas and, his, and, his, and Simon are back with the disciples in Jerusalem at this point, and Luke records that they came back, and right in the middle of Cleopas telling the disciples about Jesus, walking on the road with them, fully alive and eating, then suddenly Jesus, poof, shows up right in the middle of the room with them and, and gives the peace be with you, the cold open that almost every angel of the Lord gives. And, and I don't know about you, but I would be freaking out if that happened right here, right now. As we're talking about the resurrection, if Jesus instantaneously just showed up here on stage, poof, right there, freak me out. Didn't walk through the door, didn't walk through the back door, didn't walk through the front door, just shows up right in the middle of your group of people, in the middle of your conversation, hey, how's it going? And gives the peace be with you, don't freak out. And Jesus, like, it, that, that whole, like, don't, don't freak out. And then he says, hey, I'm a little hungry. And he sits down and eats some fish. And after eating some, Jesus then supernaturally, as only God can do, blows their mind. Completely blows their mind open. So it, he didn't spend the entire day traveling with them. He's like, let me speed this up for you. Boom. Here's some wisdom. Opened their mind to the Scriptures, to understanding it, supernaturally explaining everything to them in an instant, just blowing their mind open. So in 44, we'll continue, and he says to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all the things that are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to the Scriptures. And he said to them, so it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise from, raise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name in, to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem, you are the witnesses of these things. We'll come back to that. And then he says, Behold, I am sending a promise from my Father upon you, but you are to stay here in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. And then he led them out to Bethany, and, while he, and, he, and, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up to he, into heaven. That's kind of where Luke ends right there, and we'll get back to where Luke continues that in a second. So the next perspective that we'll want to look at is in John. So let's turn to John chapter 20. So we're looking at John chapter 21 through 28 here. And I really enjoy reading John. I love reading John's account the most because it is the most, it's one of the more detailed ones. It's very descriptive of the gospel accounts. And starting in John 1, he recounts how Mary going to the tomb once again finds the stone rolled away and Jesus is missing. And, he, and she runs and tells the disciples. In verses 4 through 7, John, once, you know, similar to Luke's account, says that upon hearing the story from Mary, not believing, Peter runs to the tomb. But this is one of the reasons I really love reading John. John shows his sense of humor here. In his letter, to, uh, in his letter he shows his sense of humor and puts in a little dig on Peter. And he notes that, I ran faster than Peter. It's, I love that, that, that John puts in a little bit of dig on his friend. 
And that he got there first to the tomb, and then Peter got there second. You don't, you don't, you can't, you couldn't imagine somebody writing this a few hundred years after this happened and then making up a dig on your best friend. No, that wouldn't happen. So this goes to validate and show how John, his account is authentic and, and real and, and personal to the, what he saw. So it goes to the validity of the Bible and of the words that are, spo- that are written here for us even today. And John notes that they didn't get it, that they didn't understand what they were looking at in 9 and 10, so they went back to the house to talk about it. And in 11, um, he, he, he adds something that we haven't seen before, and he adds that, that Mary, after they left again, so after they left the tomb, Mary stayed around, perplexed and grieving. And John records a story here that Mary was standing outside the tomb, weeping. So that, and, and as she wept, she stooped down, looked into the tomb, and there she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet of where the body of Jesus had been laying. And they said to the, her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they put him. So they, she still assumes that somebody has come and taken the body. Still doesn't quite get that he's raised from the dead. And when she had said that, she turned around and um, and when she had said that, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And yet, she didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And thinking that Jesus was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried the body away, tell me where you've put him, and I will take him back away so that she can prepare the body. And, she, and Jesus said to her, Mary, in only the way that Jesus could, Mary. And she turned to him and said in Hebrew, Rabboni! And she must have at this point given him a big bear hug or grabbed onto him because he says to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and, you, and to your Father and to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene came and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he has said these things to her. So she retells that story, which is how John knows this story and is able to capture it here, which also makes Mary the first to actually see the risen Christ. Once again, first at the tomb, first to see Christ is the women, the least of these. So verses 25 to 29 documents Jesus' first appearance to the 10 of the 11 disciples, missing Thomas. So as we go a little bit further down, reading in 19, it says that it was evening that day and the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut and the disciples were together due to fear of the Jews, so they've locked the doors because they're still afraid of the Jews coming to arrest them too, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Don't freak out. It's okay. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced and saw that it truly was Jesus. So they were able to touch him, to see him, and they showed them his side where he had been stabbed by the spear, in his hands where where the nails had been. And then in verse 21, Jesus tells them again, peace be with you. Don't freak out. Just as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Once again, I'm going to send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of of any, their sins have been forgiven of them. If you retain the sins of any, they have been retained. And and, and John here notes that Thomas was not one of the twelve. He wasn't, but Thomas, 
One of the twelve, who was called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came that time. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas says to them, Unless I see his hands in the imprint of the nails, and I put my finger in the place of the nails, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, this, is, this account was super important because it shows that Thomas didn't believe because he, even though he had seen the empty tomb, he put it, he, until he put his fingers in the scars of Jesus' hands where the Roman soldiers had stabbed him in the side, he wasn't, gonna, he, he wasn't buying it. I've seen the empty tomb because he's seen the empty tomb and he's still perplexed. He doesn't get it. He's, not, he's just not quite there yet. So, John continues on in verse 26 and says, Eight days later, so a full week later, he documents Jesus' next appearance, and this time to all 11 of them. While not detailed in John's account, this appearance might have been, so it didn't specifically say it here, I'm inferring, and based on my, my read of the Scripture and the order of which things are happening here, since this is eight days later, that this might have been when Cleopas was retelling his encounter with Jesus on the road, which was captured in Luke. Now, John doesn't say it here that these two things happened at the same time, but they might have. This might have been when Cleopas was explaining his encounter with Jesus, and then Jesus just appears in the room. So eight days later, his disciples were once again inside, and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, and the doors having been shut, and stood amongst them, saying, Peace be with you. So once again, entering a closed locked drawer, just appearing inside the room. And he said to Thomas, place your finger here and see my hands and take your hand and put it into my side and do not continue to disbelieve, but be a believer. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord, my God. And Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, Have you now believed? Blessed are those who did not see, but believe. And that is where we are, believing but not seeing. So at this point, the disciples firmly believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. They've seen Him twice. Thomas has had the opportunity as well to see Him. So Jesus has made sure that all of them... All 11 of them have seen him, seen the scars, eaten with them, and proven that he is risen in the flesh. So by inference, going back to, to, to Matthew's account where he said that some or they did not believe, they were mentioned in Matthew's account, they are definitely not the disciples. So some and the they that did not believe in Matthew's account were not the disciples, which means that there were more people there that day that saw Jesus in Galilee. So I think that relates back here to Paul's account, where we have Paul's account in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, which is more of a summary of what he was told because he wasn't, Paul wasn't an eyewitness to these things and not part of the way as they were called in the early days of the church. Remember, Paul was Saul and he was persecuting the church. He was a Pharisee at the time, so he would not have been with the disciples in the upper room behind that locked door and seeing Jesus. So he's, he's retelling and, and capturing what he's heard firsthand from multiple people. And he says that here. So in verse 1, it's kind of his, his opening here, uh, where he makes known to you, brothers and sisters, the gospel which preached to you, for I handed down to you, first importance that there is also received, that Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And in verse 4, he says that he was buried and he was raised on the third day. So this is kind of his opening for the proof of the resurrection in his letter to the Corinthians. So in verse 5, he begins to get into some details. And he says, verse 5, he says, Cephas, which frankly could be... so could either be referring to Peter and the rest of the disciples, or it could be referring to Cleopas and Simon that Luke documented. It's not really clear which Cephas he's talking about. 
I think it's more likely that Cephas, Peter, and the rest of the disciples here, that Jesus appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. In 6, Paul goes on to say that after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep, which means that of those 500, Paul has talked to many people who saw Jesus that day in Galilee. More than 500 were there, and he says, I've talked to some of these folks. I've, I've got their witness statement. And then he says, goes on in verse 7, that he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And then at last, as the one untimely born, born again, so Paul being untimely born again, he appeared to me also on the road to Damascus. So that's kind of where we end the, the four different viewpoints of the resurrection, proofs of the resurrection. And I want to go more into Jesus' last command before He ascended to be at the right hand of the Lord to await His time to come again. So Jesus, having been risen from the dead, walked around and given proof that He was alive for 40 days as we've talked about, as we've witnessed in the text here, in invalid words from those disciples and Paul who went afterwards, who validated it again, who saw Jesus on the road to Damascus, but also went and talked to other people who were there. These eyewitness accounts being recorded for us, Jesus was there for 40 days, but now it's time for Jesus to go. And Luke captures this as we get into Acts. So Acts is kind of Luke's continuation of the account of the resurrection and then more of the early church as you go into Acts. Um, it's a great read if you have time. It takes about an hour to read, hour to read, you know, hour and a half to read through Acts. It's great to read just straight through to see how that early church was born and grew exponentially. But we're going to focus here on Acts, beginning in Acts 1 where Luke continues with his, on the first account, I composed Theopolis, so say, showing that his letter in Luke went to Theopolis, so the, the letter that we call Luke in the Bible is, is, was his first letter, and here he's continuing on that, then it, where, he ta- you know, where the first account I composed, Theopolis, was about Jesus began to do and teach, and then until the day that he was taken up to heaven. And he had given orders by the Holy Spirit to the apostles from whom he was chosen. To those, those he was presented himself alive after his suffering by many convicting proofs. So proving, documenting once again that Luke restating that, hey, Jesus came after, the, after he was crucified, rose from the dead, proved that he was alive, convincing proofs, and appeared to them over a period of 40 days, which is how we know it's 40 days, and speaking of these things regarding the kingdom of God, he gathered them together and he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the, what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they began asking him and saying, Lord, is it the time that you were restoring the kingdom of Israel? So once again, they still don't fully understand, even though Jesus has already blown their mind open to understand all the Scriptures, they still have this preconceived idea because it's baked into their culture, baked into their history, baked into their teachings from the Pharisees that the second coming of Christ, the second coming of God is going to restore Israel to its former glory. And He said to them, it is not for you to know periods of time, or appointed times, which the Father has set by His own authority. But you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you shall be My witnesses both in Jerusalem and to all of Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. And after He said these things, He was lifted up while they were watching. Jesus just lifted up out of the air and ascended into the clouds out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently up in the sky where Jesus had gone, two men in white stood beside them. 
And they said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking up to the sky? This Jesus who you have been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have watched him go into the heavens. So, here Luke kind of finishes that off with the ascension into heaven. And um, I think I want to, want to kind of go back to verse 8 here and highlight that Jesus' command with them was that you shall be my witnesses. So, no, he said, no, I'm not going to redeem the, the, the nation of Israel right now. It's not for you to know when that's going to happen. You now... Your job is to be my witnesses in both Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and as far as the remotest parts of the earth. So Matthew, going back to Matthew, documents this in a little greater detail. And, and Matthew talks about this beginning in verse 18. And, he's, and, and so it, this is kind of similar telling, similar time frame. So Jesus right before his, his ascension, says, and spoke to them, with all authority of heaven and earth have been given me, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I have commanded to you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age." All right, I really want that to sink in. So I'm going to reread it. It's short and direct to the point with no ambiguity, no parable stories here from Jesus. At this point, Jesus has already opened their minds to the Scriptures, and the only thing left for them to do after this is, is, is to wait in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. So he says, wait there, and then go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them and to follow all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's known as the Great Commission. And this, all of this that I've explained to you today, all of this, the proof of the resurrection, is the proof of the Bible, is the word of the one and true and only God, who is worthy of our worship, our praise, and our obedience. This is the proof. Eleven of the twelve apostles would go on to die a martyr's death with no money, no great wealth, persecuted by their own people. John was imprisoned on Patmos. Paul was beaten by people he once called friends and mentors. Peter died on the, ups, on the cross upside down. Why? Why would 11 of the 12 disciples go on to die for this belief? Paul being beheaded. Because the disciples and the apostles that they were called after this point, they saw Christ arrested. They saw Him beaten. They saw that He died on the cross. They saw Him buried in the tomb and the roll, stone rolled in front of it. And then they saw with their own eyes with convincing proofs that He was resurrected again, living again, eating dinner with them. So why would they die for this belief? Because they knew the truth. And they couldn't, they wouldn't, they wouldn't disobey their last command from God Himself, proclaiming as the resurrected Savior all the way up until their death, fulfilling this last command to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to follow all that I have commanded you. And behold, I will be with you always to the ends of the age." So what are you going to do with that last, last command that the Lord and Savior has given you? It's the same as they gave, He gave to the disciples to us today. We are still in that same time period. This is the last command that God has given us as humans on this earth, as, as believers on this earth, is to go. 
What are you going to do with that? First off, if you still have questions or don't fully understand or believe the Word and proof of the resurrection and the salvation of our sins that we just kind of walked through today, it's okay. Ask more questions. Ask more questions of me. Ask more questions of Nate, of the elders, of the others around our church. Reread the accounts that I've walked through today. Cross-reference them. Research them. Read the book of Romans. Come and ask. But for those who understand and believe already, are you still sure, unsure of what to do with that last command? Unsure of how to put that into action in our lives right now? Unsure of how to do that? Let's talk about some tips and tricks, some ideas. And bring this down to things that you can do today. Whether you've been a Christian a week or decades, here's a starting point. First, understand, believe, and live out the gospel. Be prepared to defend your faith. Be prepared to share your story. In your bulletin, I have a sheet of paper. Go ahead and pull that out. The big, the, it's a folded one. So this is a guide for you. This is a helpful tip, a helpful tool for you to write your own story. Quick tips. Keep it short. 30 seconds to three, four minutes. Not real long. Have a before, how, and after. So what happened before you were saved? How did you get saved? How did you believe? What made you believe this? And then what? What was your change? What did God do in your life that reflects something that only God could do? Share the gospel as the source of your changed life. The death, the burial, resurrection, and saved through grace. Avoid using Christianese words. Make it plain speak. And lastly, practice it. Read it to yourself. Several times if needed. I read this sermon twice a day and I still fumbled the ball several times. Read it already this, you know, several times this week and I still struggled through it. So practice. Know your story. Because your story is part of God's story. Next thing. Be present. Be, be a present and active participant here at CCF. Not just showing up on Sunday mornings, but actively engaging God, actively serving here with us in the community of Christians, worshiping and growing in the knowledge of God, sharing that and making disciples of others, just as Jesus commanded of us. During the week, read your Bible. We have a multitude of studies available in our library here at CCF if you need a theme, if you need a focus area. We, there's, there's hundreds and thousands of them available online in your Bible app. So if you're already past steps one and four, and it's okay that some of you aren't. I know I wasn't when I first started coming here 13 years ago. It took me a while to get there. But if you're already steps, past steps one and four that I talked about, congratulations. You are as ready as God needs you to be to be Christ's witness. To go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them how to follow all that Christ commanded. So where or how do you go? So we want to provide that opportunity to you. In your bulletin is a second piece of paper, and this one I want you to pull out, and we're going to walk through this real quickly. This is a way of a, this is a list of things and the ways that we are going to go in the next year here at CCF. I'm challenging you right now to fill it out, to fill out your name at the top of the list, to check one or more items that you are committing to actively participate and begin to fulfill it, fill, fulfill. 
Christ's last command to all of us that remain on this earth until He remains. So the very first one is, I have more questions. If you have more questions, that's totally okay. If you're not ready, it's okay. Put your name there. Check the box. One of the elders, one of us will reach out to you. We'll connect with you. We'll have lunch with you. We'll have some coffee. We'll hang out. We'll, we'll meet with you at your house, here at the church. We'll try our best to answer those questions where we don't have answers. We'll reach out to others. But to the rest, I challenge you, put your name in here. I am ready for God to use me to do what? Are you ready? It starts easy, and as you get further down this list, it gets a lot harder. First step I've got here, write a Google review on our church. People find our church online. How many of you shop online? None of you? Really? Wow. Oh, John does. Okay. So, I shop online. I shop online, and what do I do? I look at how many stars a thing has. Whether it's a restaurant or a service nowadays on Yelp, they all have stars. We have stars as a church. Did you know that? We're online, and there's, there's stars on us. Write a Google review on the church. Why do you come here? Talk about it. Why are we so important that you show up every Sunday and commit your time to serving Christ here with us as a fellowship? Hopefully, you give us five stars. If you've written your testimony, we ask that you share that testimony with us, that you record that testimony, that you allow us to record that testimony and explain to why people, or explain why people should come here to the church on a, on a recording. We can use that on our social media. We can put that on our website. We can share that with others. If you're willing to do that, check that box. If you are on social media and you're a regular person on social media and you're, you're on Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, like and share the posts here that we put up by, by CCF. That adds to our reach within the community. That adds to our reach across the nation. That adds to our reach to reach the lost. It's simple. If you are a creator on social media, so that means you create videos, you create content, you create images, you create photos. If that's something you're good at, you can use that skill to tell the gospel. You can use that skill to share Christ, and we want to help you do that. Come check that box. Come see us. We'll talk with you. Here's one everybody can do. I'm going to invite somebody to church with me. I want you to write the name of that person. Who are you going to invite? Think about a, a specific person that you want to invite to church. If you are want, ready to go outside these walls, we have an opportunity through all of our missions all, uh, to go and help. So, Mary Hall is our, is our lead for missions, and she has opportunities for you to serve. Opportunities at uh, Carry to Full Term, at Life First, and Reset 180. John is going to Costa Rica in a few weeks to, to serve there. He's going outside of our walls. They're not hard stuff. Mary will tell you that they need menial tasks. Some of it's just like painting a wall or, or doing some maintenance, some, some cleaning around the house, putting up some flyers around town. They're not hard tasks. It's not like I, I don't need you to be a counselor to go and serve at these places. God doesn't need that yet. If you want to be a part of where our vision is going here at CCF, where we're going to be able to go outside of these walls, how we're going to take the Word from Christ outside these walls, be part of Team Go here at CCF. I'd love to have you part of that team. Brainstorm some ideas with me. There's some other challenges here that we have. We don't have a youth leader anymore that's paid, so we need our lay persons, our, you, our, our church members to step up and serve, not just in the youth. We have gaps in youth. We have gaps in other places. You see that on the screen every Sunday. Serve here in the church. If you're willing to serve, check the box. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a conversation about what your skills are, what God's gifts are for you, and then figure out a best place to put you. We certainly have need in the youth. We have need for a young adults community group. We don't have a young adults community group. 
We have young adults in this church already. That is a place where we really want to bring people in, but we don't have that right now. If you are far enough on your walk and you're ready to mentor somebody else, if you're ever to walk alongside somebody else as they begin their walk with Christ, check that last box. Let's have a conversation. Nate is, would love to have a conversation with you about how can you mentor, how can you walk with somebody through the 201, the 101, the 201, 301, 401 classes that he's going to be doing. That spiritual formulation classes, formation classes, that, that sanctification. Let's, if you're willing to walk through that with somebody, check that box, let us know. Take this form, fill it out, put it in the offering box. I challenge you to do that today. Lord, I just ask you to, to open our ears, open our eyes, open our minds to the Scripture. Open our minds to understand how vital it is, how critical it is for us to be ready, how, us, how, how, how foundational the resurrection is and the last challenge that you gave us to go and make disciples of all, all nations. Lord, we just thank you for that. We thank you for our time here today. If you, Lord, have, have will for us, let us really speak to you now, Lord. As we, as we share and worship together, as we sing this last song, open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds, open our, just, just pour into us, Lord, those opportunities, those places where you want us to be your witness. In your name I pray.